My friend, the journalist Larissa Zimbaroff, is what you might call an adventurous eater. There's plant cell cultured chocolate where they're actually culturing the cacao cells. Okay, so I tried that. It wasn't that good. Um, but I've tried deli meats and turkey cutlets that aren't made from turkey, but are made from mycelium, which are the underground root network of mushrooms. When Larissa has a bagel with a schmear, the cream cheese comes from protein derived from extremophile microbes that grow in geysers at Yellowstone. I've tried algae in various formats. I've tried duckweed, which is also called lemna. It's a single cell organism, and the duckweed, they tell me, makes a great egg replacer. The protein, the pond scum, is being turned into um, an egg or an egg white or a protein that makes a macaron or makes a pound cake. Larissa has become one of the world's few connoisseurs of future food in its beta testing stage, lab to table cuisine. And so last March, when Wild Type invited her to their tasting room to sample sushi grade salmon grown from immortalized coho cells, she was down. San Francisco based Wild Type is a leader in the cell cultured seafood space. Their salmon is not available to the public, not yet. No cell-based meat is. But the FDA has already given a thumbs up to two companies growing chicken from scratch. And Wild Type is one of more than a dozen companies racing to bring cell-cultured seafood to a dinner table near you. Now, if you're imagining a slice of lox served fresh from the Petri dish, let me set the scene. There's a chef, first of all. Larissa recognized her right away from the last season of Top Chef. And she's showcased wild type salmon in three elegant presentations on a slice of toasted brioche with creme fraiche and herbs, served ceviche style with a dash of citrus, and minced and spicy like the inside of a salmon roll. Wild type's founders and staff looked on as she dug in. This was a supercharged version of the classic critic visits the restaurant scene we, we know from movies like Big Night or Chef, except that in this case, the meal in question took years of research and millions of dollars to produce. I got very excited and, you know, kind of like very eager to sit down and try these things. Before we got to what it tasted like, why would anyone want to grow salmon from cells? According to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, more than a third of the world's marine fisheries are in danger of collapse. Popular fish like Atlantic cod, swordfish, Chilean sea bass, and bluefin tuna are particularly threatened. And rising levels of heavy metals and other contaminants like microplastics make, make eating certain kinds of fish a risky prospect. But this hasn't stopped us from chowing down on fish sticks and tuna rolls. In fact, global seafood consumption more than doubled between 1990 and 2018. The hopeful pioneers of cell-cultured seafood promise a bounty of fish, shellfish, and crustaceans, free of toxic pollutants with a fraction of the environmental impact and no animal suffering. But this plan only works if people want to eat the stuff. You might expect salmon cells grown in a bioreactor to taste a lot like, well, ordinary salmon. After all, the cells used in cell egg come from real living fish. Same cells, same genes, same flavor, right? But flavor isn't just an expression of DNA. It's also a reflection of the life lived by an animal before it became our food. Flavor tells the story of the journey from planet to plate. Wine people out there may know the schmancy word terroir. That's French for taste of place, and it refers to the way the land and labor of a specific region shape our experience of the flavors in the glass. The terroir concept has spread from the wine world to encompass all kinds of things, from clams to cannabis. 
So where does that leave cell-cultured seafood, which is grown in sterile vats designed to be scalable, standardizable, and deployable everywhere? Is there such a thing as laboratory terroir? First things first, how do you build a fish from cells good enough to feed a planet of hungry human pescivores? So I'm David Kaplan, a professor uh, in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Tufts University in Boston. Dr. Kaplan and his students are developing the technologies and techniques to cultivate and grow seafood and shellfish, which still remains a couple of steps behind cell culturing terrestrial animals. A big challenge for researchers working on culturing seafood is our wide-ranging voraciousness for all of the fruity di mare, the manifold and motley fruits of the sea, hundreds of species of vertebrate fish, as well as invertebrates like oysters and octopuses. Compare that with pork. Sure, there are different breeds out there, but bacon and chops all come from the same kind of animal. Not so for salmon and cod or lobster and eel. The processes we use for fish are very, very different than what we use for terrestrial animals, like for cows and pigs and chickens. Um, and so every time we, we look to isolate and grow cells from different fish species, it's really uh, almost starting over. To recreate something, you must know it intimately. Establishing new cell lines often means getting on a boat and going fishing. We do a muscle biopsy you know, right there on the boat to try and isolate cells from the fresh tissue. One time. Seas were very rough and none of us were well equipped. Um, some people took Dramamine, which was smart. I've been on boats my whole life, so I didn't think I needed it, but I was wrong. An epic bout of seasickness. It was so worth it, though. Kaplan and his colleagues caught a mackerel that day that they successfully immortalized. Was it the tastiest mackerel that ever did swim in the cold, cold waters off Massachusetts Bay? Who knows? When I began researching this story, I dreamed about endless rivers of salmon cultured from the cells of prize-winning fish, about the possibility of mass-cultivating toro from the tastiest tuna sold at Tsukiji Market. I imagine that the fish bequeathing their cells to our cell-cultured future would be chosen in part for their deliciousness. I soon learned that taste is not a primary concern when selecting specimens for cell lines. Researchers like Kathleen are looking for cells that are good performers and good team players, not flavor bombs. Think about it this way. When we take a bite of fish, we're consuming different kinds of cells, muscle, fat, connective tissues, arrayed together in accordance with the vital requirements of the species. Think of the flakiness of grilled sea bass, the way the fillet separates into layers with the gentlest prod of a fork. The sea bass's body grows like this so that it can live, but it won't grow this way unassisted in a bioreactor. Producers of cell-cultured seafood must find ways to recreate or mimic the three-dimensional arrangements of cells. This has to come first. The cellular architecture that produces texture is the framework for flavor. Which brings me back to Larissa and her epic taste test. The bite and the chew was, I didn't feel, I felt like I was biting more into like uh, some kind of gelatin based product than a muscle based product. I thought, if we eat with our eyes, that visually it's, it's good enough and it's there. I think if someone's gonna try it plain, like me, they're not gonna see it working yet. But I think like in a poke experience, I think it might be great. The look was right on, but the texture wasn't quite ready for prime time. I thought the flavor was very mild, super, super mild, without any kind of fishiness. And 
both founders said that that was because I actually didn't know what fresh fish tasted like because I never get to taste fresh salmon. The seafood we eat now is often far removed from its place of origin, whether wild caught or farmed, and is almost certainly frozen at some point. Even fish bought right off the boat at a dockside market may have been captured weeks earlier. But if cell-cultured seafood becomes a reality, seafood could be produced anywhere. This could radically change the landscape of food production. Someday, a prairie oyster grown in bioreactors in landlocked Oklahoma may be as fresh as any well fleet slurped at a Cape Cod clam bake. So let's say companies like Wild Type get the texture and taste of cell-cultured seafood to be indistinguishable from the real thing. Well, what is the taste of the real thing? The oceans are changing because of climate change and other anthropogenic factors. So the fish of the near future may not taste quite like the ones we nosh on today. And there's another thing that can change. Our appetites and our desires, our sense of what tastes good. Deliciousness isn't just a matter of flavor profiles. It's also social and cultural. What makes food good to us is shaped by what we know about the food, where it comes from, how it's made, by our values. So maybe we have to recalibrate our expectations and learn to savor the unplaceable freshness of laboratory terroir and entirely new taste experiences too. There is no other option, technological option I know of, if you want fish-like food that's healthy, high quality and safe than going to a cellular agricultural approach. And the beautiful thing here is you not only can isolate cells from fish people know about and eat today, but you can isolate cells from even fish that have become, you know, difficult to raise, uh, rare, used to be commonplace, now aren't, you're worried about fish stocks. You know, you can, you can isolate cells from any of these fish and start to create foods that are even expand the palate further. And at that point, there's no limit. No limit. How to get there is a question for another day. And this is the promise and the pitfall of food futurism. The spoils of the distant future are sometimes much more enticing than the struggles required to attain them. Thank you.